Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Red Raptor Writes. Last time, I reviewed Nat Geo's Sea Monsters, and it's been a while. Sorry about that guys, student teaching is a lot of work. But now that it's over, let's get back to the reviews. Next on the list is, well you read the title, Monsters Resurrected. <coughs> I specifically remember watching the Spinosaurus episode on TV with my dad probably not long after it came out. My parents are also the ones who introduced me to Jurassic Fight Club, so yeah, I probably should have called Child Protective Services. Ever since I was a youngling, this show garnered a reputation as one of the worst paleo shows out there. The Spino in particular is now a total joke among any paleo community. However, I think we should give Discovery a fair shake here. Instead of giving into pressure and handing out an easy F, we should see what Monsters Resurrected gets right, and of course gets wrong. I can't promise any surprises, but I'll do my best to be fair, starting with the first three episodes and then covering the later four. So guys, let's dig this up. I'm sure many of you just want to see me tear this thing apart, but for the time being, let's talk about what this dino doc gets right. Don't worry, the list probably won't be too long. Episode 1, Terror Bird, features the American forest racket, Titanus. Much of this episode isn't bad. For starters, at least the Titanus looks like its real life counterpart. I can tell that it's a terror bird with its long legs, tiny wings, and thick beak that's hooked at the end. It certainly would have been a formidable predator with the deadly weaponry. Unlike the flat beaked Gastornis, a terror bird wannabe that ate nuts instead. Ow! Monsters Resurrected accurately shows Titanus using their beaks to pummel large prey. It looks strange, but ends up in the realm of possibility. The neck muscles of Forest Rackids were useful for that strong forwards and backwards movement for striking. Side to side, not so much, so their beaks were good at withstanding sagittal forces as opposed to lateral forces. This means that they either hunted small prey that wouldn't struggle too much, or performed quick strikes on large prey, like we see here. These terror birds are also correctly placed in North America about 2 million years ago, being special in both ways. Not only was it among the last of its kind, but one of the only forest vacids outside of South America. I have to admit, not too bad. Titanus looks and acts apart. Even the Smilodon and Edward's Wolf, I like the comparisons made between modern predators. How, like lions, would have been ambush predators with their short and stocky bodies not being suited for long distance chases. While wolves and canines are better at long distance pursuits, tiring out their prey, making them an easy meal. It's cool that we also see the giant ground sloth, Megalonyx, even if its only role is to get murdered. Both terror birds and ground sloths came from South America and immigrated to North America, being two of the few successful South American groups to do so. Luckily for them, the wall hasn't been built yet, but I say we keep those terror birds out of here and make them pay for it. Another welcome addition is our first true look at Carcharodontosaurus. I've been a fanboy of these guys ever since I played JPOG as a kid with their emo look. It's sad that our time with the car car is so brief, as its only role is to be the Spino punching bag. Welcome to the club. Welcome to our club! Welcome to our club! Spino and the sharp-toothed lizard did cohabitate in North African Chemchem beds in the Cenomadian stage of the late Cretaceous. I just wish we got to see more of it, because aside from some shrink wrapping, it looks great. The Tylosaurus 2 has some outdated design flaws, but for its time, looks about right. Interestingly enough, it's even given a forked tongue, which is a bit of speculation that's not too uncommon in paleo art. Although no perfectly preserved forked tongue soft tissue has been found, Mosasaurs were squamates, relatives of lizards and snakes. Through the use of phylogenetic bracketing, one may assume that because its relatives had this feature, they did too. Oh, and this is another point the show got right. 
Is Mosasaurids descending from lizards or lizard-like ancestors? Through Dallasaurus, we get to see the transition from land to sea, then dominance of the oceans in such a brief period of time. And for the third time on this channel, I'll be complimenting the interspecies combat we see between Tylosaurus. I'm sure the Discovery Channel absolutely jumped at the idea of a Mosasaur fight, but truth be told, there is fossil evidence to support this since a specimen of Tylosaurus kansasensis with fatal bite marks, seemingly from another Tylosaurus. And the last part of the show's first half I'll compliment is the inclusion of some familiar faces from sea monsters, Styxosaurus and Dolly Carinchops, plus the returning Kratoxy Rhina, also known as the Ginsu Shark. There isn't much footage, so I've gotta be brief here. Yeah, they have the correct shape, blunt wide head, and did grow 25 feet long. That's a 20 footer. 25. Three tons of them. It's very easy to point and laugh at this portrayal of Spinosaurus, heck, I do it all the time. We do have to remember though, Monsters Resurrected released in a pre-2014 world. Nizar Ibrahim had not yet discovered his specimen that showed off the creature's short hind limbs. Although, maybe that's for the best, since he immediately went too far in the other direction, presenting Spino as a knuckle-walking quadruped pursuit predator. Not to toot my own horn, but from the start, I thought that was crazy, and apparently, doctors Hone and Holtz agree with me. Because, science. Science, Meredith, science! This, of course, means that Spino's tail is right for the time, too. With a 2018 discovery, it is widely known that Spinosaurus had a paddle-like tail with tall caudal vertebrae, perfect for propelling the animal through the water, like a salamander or crocodilians. Unfortunately, the animators weren't given a time machine to hear about this. Instead, what we're given is avoided out baryonics with a sail, and we know this because that's literally what they claim to do for their recreation. Dr. Ibrahim also speculated on the neurospines that gave this creature its name, considering the idea of the dip in the middle that we're so used to seeing by now. Monsters Resurrected goes for that typical 2000s look, with the spines arranged in a neat arch along the back. While the older look does feel more visually pleasing, as my brain likes to smooth the neatness of it, we do need to consider other interpretations as equally plausible. I reject your reality and substitute my own. So despite all the paleo media that ran with the dip idea, that's still only speculative. It is worth mentioning too, how back in the 2000s, some estimates did give Spinosaurus a max length of 59 feet or 18 meters, like the documentary says. So they weren't just going ham in that regard. Newer studies give more red-pilled conservative estimates of up to 50 feet or 15 meters. Just so we're clear, I am well aware that every point I make about Spinosaurus may cause keyboard warriors to go crazy in one way or another. So I'd like to point out that there is still so much we don't know about this dinosaur, and scientists are hard at work unraveling its mysteries. Its behavior, biomechanics, appearance, and classifications are all up in the air at this point. Did Spino catch fish in the water as a pursuit predator, or was it more suited to fishing on riverbanks? What was the shape of the sail? How was it even used? Are Sigilmosasaurus and Ashalaya junior synonyms? Do more recent finds even belong to the same species as the original, Spinosaurus aegyptiacus? Yeah, its depictions have come a long way since 10 years ago, but there is still much to learn and much disagreement until then. I swear, World War 3 will be started by all the Spino fans with differing opinions. In the meantime, let's be patient and wait for more research to give us a clearer picture of these animals. Ah, yes. The negotiator. Onto a more peaceful note, once again, mosasaurs are now known to have tail flukes which would have helped propel them through the water. Finally, something we can all agree on. Whether Monsters Resurrected is accurate or not is debatable. Aside from all the obvious problems, of course. Let's take wolves for example. If there was a documentary on wolves that only showed them fighting and killing, the zoology presented may be factually correct in the way they fight and kill, but there is plenty more to wolves than killing. 
You could talk about socializing, hierarchies, parenting, maturing, and relations with humans. So if only killing is mentioned, is it still accurate? This dino doc suffers here. Every episode, nearly every scene revolves around killing in some way. To be or not to be. Even points that aren't necessarily about killing get brought into being about killing. No, dinosaurs and prehistoric creatures in general were not just bloodthirsty monsters who murdered everything in sight. Although our insight into their lives can be severely limited, dinosaurs were animals who lived regular animal lives. This applies to all the other paleofauna we see too. Either these other aspects are ignored or used as an excuse to push more violence. I don't know, can we just get a series where dinosaurs sit around, play video games, and hit a jewel? Do they always need to be murdering things? This occurs when discussing the conical teeth of Spinosaurus. Instead of using it as evidence for fish eating like any logical program would, that footage of Rugops getting annihilated plays again and again. In fact, fish don't even get a mention until past the 30 minute mark. That's 75% of the way through in a Spinosaurus documentary, and there is zero footage of it ever eating a fish. Instead, it keeps snacking on poor Rugops. That perfectly segues us into one of the worst subjects we're tortured with. What is this? This Abelisaurid must be using anchor arms because there's no way they look like this. Rugops and its relatives had puny vestigial arms without much in the way of function. To make matters worse, these guys are given estimates of 30 feet in length. Even estimates from the time were closer to 20 feet, but more recent studies suggest their length to be more than mid-teens. But if Rugops grew to 30 feet, then how in Shrek's glorious name did Spino fit one in its mouth? I'm about to say my least favorite words. Let's do some math. Hypothetically speaking, if the Rugops is 30 feet in length and the Spino's head is an equivalent length, that means the head is about 30 feet too. Back in reality, a spino skull is only about 5.5 feet in length. If we scale that up to 30 feet, that would make it 5.45 repeating times the actual size. If we apply that scale to the total actual length of 50 feet, that would make the monster's resurrected Spinosaurus approximately 273 feet in length. Okay, I know we keep talking about the Biggest Killer Dino episode, but it's so infamous for a reason. In addition to showing those long, outdated legs, Spinosaurus is portrayed as a fast-running predator chasing down prey. Even if it did have those old, longer legs, it's doubtful that an animal that big can move that fast. The head is missing that single crest that's so common in Spinosaurids too. Theropod wrists in the show could be a lot worse. Most of the time, they are in the correct inwards facing position. Woo! Yeah, baby! That's what I've been waiting for! That's what it's all about! Woo! Unfortunately for my soul, that for some reason hasn't taken enough punishment. On occasion, they flex their wrists downwards. Another inaccuracy, as if there weren't enough, is the inclusion of Sarcosuchus as a contemporary of the Spino. While they both lived in North Africa, the Sarco went extinct over 10 million years prior. A time-traveling deathmatch between prehistoric predators sounds cool, but isn't this Discovery Channel? Isn't this supposed to be educational? One of the mammals, featured as the rival of Titanus, Edward's wolf, makes several poorly animated appearances. While they are presented as really just these big gray wolves, the Edwards wolf is actually considered an ancestor to the coyote, so the creator should have taken more inspiration there. And eh, never mind, as long as we get to see fluffy puppies, it's all good. The narrator makes a correct statement that terror birds were related to T-Vex, which yeah, I guess they're both Salorosaurians, but it seems like the narrators are calling similarities between the two homologous. Yeah, they both had powerful legs, a large head, and small arms, but forest vacids are secondarily flightless. They're birds. They descended from small birds. This is convergent evolution, not divergent. The last major problem we need to address is in Episode 2, T-Rex of the Deep. Well, first of all, that's a stupid name. Can we stop comparing everything to T-Vex? 
that species has become a unit of measurement at this point. Every extinct creature and their mothers get compared to Tyrannosaurus for no good reason. Secondly, I have no idea why, but they refuse to call the predator Tylosaurus. Clearly, the unnamed Mosasaur is Tylosaurus, and clearly it's based on the Tylosaurus. But for whatever weird reason, the writers never call it that. Honestly, the first two episodes aren't even that bad. Alone, they might have gotten, or C, or B if I'm feeling really generous. But episode 3, Biggest Killer Dino, alone tanks the entire show. The final four episodes won't get much better, but one can only hope. So hold on to the popcorn, part two is coming shortly. But until then, remember if you enjoyed this video to please leave a like, subscribe, and check out my social media. See you next time.